Bangalore was still a little sleepy and friendly and the club was one of the main sort of sources of entertainment for us because all of us would uh, come to the club, spend time in the evenings, bring the children here during the day, take them swimming during the holidays and uh, occasionally swim ourselves without the children. I used to literally live here, you know. Whenever we had free time, I used to come here and the children would swim. We could indulge in sports activities, we could read, we could um, be entertained and um, eat your lunch, dinner, breakfast. It's so safe, it's so central, there's no parking problems. And I know that when uh, I come here, I'm always going to meet a friend or some members who I know. It's such a nice feeling rather than, you know, sitting at home by yourself. And I, I really look forward to the club. <laughs> The men's bar, how can we forget the men's bar? At one time it was the men's bar and no women and children allowed. The 19th century gentlemen's clubs of London were private institutions founded by returning British officers from India. It was where they came to retreat from wars, the world and even women. East India Company box wallers and businessmen were firmly kept out. Senior British Army and Royal Navy officers met here over rice and curry or perhaps even a glass of port to discuss sports and politics or to recall active service in India. The Karnatak, Anglo-Mysore and Anglo-Maratha wars were now over. The garrisons settled into the new Bangalore cantonment that had been established in 1809. Bangalore was one of the largest military stations in the country. The Queen's own Madras sappers and miners now the Madras Engineering Group and other prestigious regiments were stationed here. It was also where the famous Bangalore torpedo would be developed to overcome beach defences at Normandy during the Second World War. The officers took advantage of Bangalore's beautiful weather. They spent time outdoors hunting leopards and snipe and even fishing. Like a young fourth hussar named Winston Churchill, they admired roses and played polo. Some of them also courted young ladies fresh off the boats from England. Bangalore was one of the liveliest stations in the presidency. Senior officers entertained at the mess, attended military balls and frequented the South Parade near the parade grounds. There was virtually no traffic on the roads. Policemen in skirts with those funny kind of hats. I mean, on a Sunday morning, we'd go riding a bicycle all over MG Road without any problem. There were no dividers, there was nothing. There were a lot of trees, but basically it was a great place to grow up. The officers' only military clubs, founded around sporting activities in colonial India, would appear in Bangalore only towards the latter half of the 19th century. In 1868, a group of polo-playing officers who met regularly over the game founded a private military club for senior army and then navy officers in Bangalore. It was housed in a bungalow near the western boundary of the cantonment and called the United Service Club. The United Service Club had a majestic clubhouse with a Madras terrace roof, stables for horses, residential quarters, a rackets court and a beautiful dining hall. You couldn't go into the dining room for dinner unless you were properly dressed which meant that the men had to have a tie and jacket. And those days we had a um, chief steward and he'd always keep extra ties in his pocket. <laughs> Rules and etiquette were established along the lines of the United Service Club of London. In Bangalore Club, the dress restrictions for the New Year, no combinations, lounge suit. Ladies would step out of the ladies' only area, the Dove Court, and then into the main clubhouse, only when it became a mixed club in 1939. This is now one of the oldest libraries in Bangalore, with over 20,000 books. I, I feel it's a very good library. It's very popular. It still is, despite Kindle. The, the books are still 
used very well. The atmosphere was beautiful in the billiard room. The men didn't exclude us ladies. We were most welcome. So we used to organize tournaments, open tournaments, handicap tournaments, singles, doubles, mixed doubles. It was quite an informal uh, tournament that we had at that time for mixed doubles where the ladies came in in saris and played. There was no dress code and I used to always be in a sari. The men of course enjoyed themselves trying to coach the ladies because they had no idea of how to play at that time. And I played the nationals too in a sari and won it. <laughs> Club presidents and members rewrote city history and still contribute to it. These distinguished officers, British residents, chief architects, military engineers, surveyors and eventually civil servants drafted the Mysore constitution, planned city extensions and brought electricity to Bangalore. Colonel J.P. Grant, one of the club's founding members and president several times over, was responsible for the first revenue survey of Mysore Grant Road, now Vithal Malya Road, was named after him. Brigadier R.C.R. Hill, president of the club for over 20 years, in whose memory the Brigadier Hill Terrace and the Brigadier Hill Annex are named, made significant contributions to the club. He oversaw the drafting of the club constitution, the entry of Indian members, and despite opposition, a smooth transition to civilian membership post-independence. The elegant ballroom inside the annex occupies a pride of place in the club. It is where generations of club members have danced into the night. Well, at least some of them have. I don't ever believe there was a single girl who landed up with our group. You know? We have always had to come here and get up to some kind of mischief to get them to dance with us. Because every time we asked, they'd say no. You know? I don't know why, but that's the way it was, you know. And, uh, but they'd go out with other guys, you know. We were a little more rowdies. The Maharaja of Mysore was the club's first invited Indian member in 1901, while in 1918, Colonel Desraj Ars, Commander-in-Chief of the Mysore Forces in World War I, and Divan Sir Kantaraj Ars were elected as special honorary members. The club was also influenced by world history. When military forces in the cantonment were moved overseas during World War II, it became a civilian club. The military connection stays strong, and officers continue to be permanent and temporary members. In 1946, on the eve of India's independence, a new direction would emerge with a new name, the Bangalore Club. Despite a changing world outside, the club still preserves many of its original structures. This colonial residency style building is now one of the last of its kind. The club is also a watchful protector of Bangalore's natural heritage. The trees in its gardens are old, familiar friends. I started planting like the people tree behind the tennis court. Then I planted some cassia, japonica, at the side of the tennis court on the Lavelle roadside. A whole lot of mahogany and also the cassia outside Food World. This spirit of the past also provided the perfect setting for Prince Charles's visit to the city and the period film, A Passage to India. When um, the scenes for Passage to India were shot, Dame Peggy Ashcroft coming in a Victoria and into the portico and and we were extras in some scenes as well. A mellow charm lingers in every corner and every lasting memory. You know, it's modern, but yet it encompasses the old world charm. One of the favorite dishes of many of the older uh, members of the club is the chicken sandwich. Texture, the flavor, it was really great. And my father was so fond of his chicken sandwiches, he repeatedly asked me whether I could make similar sandwiches for him at home, but I never succeeded. While eternal favourites on the menu continue to be relished by each successive generation, new experiences are also savoured enthusiastically. 
The club is connected to its past but also keeps pace with the future through modern technology, a low ecological footprint and regular upgrading of its facilities. A balance is also maintained between the sporting, social and the intellectual. Laura Woodbridge was really an institution. She would be here every afternoon at 2.30, read the newspapers and then go to the court and she would play for half an hour with uh, the marker or whoever was there. I used to swim competitively. I did a lot of my training here. Uh, it was all very benign, you know, I mean, but I learned virtually everything here. There's something for everyone. Music and dance, bands and balls, quiz contests, film screenings, talks and readings, children's events and the annual Christmas party. There was a lorry that came right, you know, backed up to the steps and an elephant backed out. So they used to unload the Christmas party elephant at the steps of the billiard room. But the club's most precious legacy has stayed constant through the decades. Club itself is, is still that beautiful space that it always was. It's like an oasis in the middle of the city. This is like a family home to us. A home away from home. And for a lot of the guys, you know, it's the best place to come <laughs> and hang out. You know, you want to be a bit of peace, some sort of sanctuary, I come running to the club. <laughs>